so many people have different views about what Lung Po Chao taught. Uh, you know, I found, you know, as other days, they're trying to say Du Jin, two very short words. You know, I can't speak for other people, but this is what I picked up from it, and which I found very useful, because uh, in that first year, while I was, you know, struggling to, you know, to uh, survive in a totally different social milieu and everything changed, I could do jit, I could watch, I observed a lot, you know, my own, you know, frustration, resentment, the way I would misinterpret the behavior of the monks or Ajahn Chah, the way I'd create problems, the way I'd force opinions, project my views about what Ajahn Chah is like, on, you know, I think Ajahn Chah is like this. And, and sometimes, you know, I didn't, I was angry with him, so then I'd project him, Ajahn Chah is not fair to Tarangs or something like this. You know, I became aware of this as a creation, you know, because of the mood, is something I create and project, but not something to operate from, to grasp and believe in. Then, Tamanu Pasna Sadipatana is where you're actually using, like the Dhamma, the Four Noble Truths, and Paticca Samupad of Dependent Origination. All these teachings are very helpful to help us to to look at Dhamma in, from different aspects. So we're, you know, we're not just trying to get rid of our suffering or, you know, personally break through to reality, but we have very skillful tools, traditional tools, that help us to observe and to gain insight through understanding suffering, through letting go of the causes of suffering. Second Noble Truth is about letting go. Third is about realizing, like Naroda, is the reality. You suddenly experience reality through Naroda. When you actually observe, you know, cessation of a condition in your mind is like this. You're, you're aware, awakened to the real, to the Rhoda, and then the, the path is is cultivating, you know, cultivating this awareness into, you know, so it integrates into your life, the way you use it, you know, monastic life with its Vinaya and its tradition makes our life very simple, because it's, it's, it's a simple way of life, even though it looks complicated, to, to most people, the 227 Padimokha rules can sound incredibly complicated because most people can't even manage five precepts very well. <laughs> and then they say, we have 227. They go, oh God, that must be really, a, you know, very confusing to keep track of 227. And then there's all the ones outside there in the Vinaya Padika. And it just seems, you know, it seems, huh? it makes life so complicated being moral and and mindful. <laughs> but I realize that it, it, you know, what this tradition does is it, it's tempting to release us from the ego and to to be, begin to observe our own emotional reactions to restraint, to authority, to to tradition, to a different culture. I mean, we, we have our various emotional reactions to Thailand or to whatever country we're in or, you know, to the restriction and restraint and the hierarchy, the seniority, to the personalities we have to live with. You know, we have to live with, with monks, but they have different personalities. They're all not like, you know, the Buddha, which is perfect. They're, they have you know, some kind of strange personality. Some of them are very weird. <laughs> With them too, but it's still mindfulness, isn't it? Being aware of how somebody above us affects us. Being senior or we're, or junior to us is like this. And I'm a monkey, you know. One monk used to say, I'm never going to be in our job. 
because he had this thing that all Ajahns were authoritarian, bossy, arrogant, so and so. And so he says, I'm never going to be an Ajahn. And so, so he had this, you know, he project this Ajahn thing, he created an Ajahn into a kind of a authoritarian know-it-all that, that keeps trying to tell him what to do. And then after he got ten punches, he became an Ajahn. <laughs> And he was just as good a bossy as the rest. <laughs> <laughs> but these are important issues, you know, when you put yourself in like the Samaneras or, or junior monks, you know, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. You, you know, you, you don't have any clout, any authority. <laughs> and maybe you're an older person or you know, maybe you're somebody that's been a CEO of some big corporation in New York City, and now you're just merely a summonera. And then some junior monk tells you to wash his bowl, and, and you know what you'd think, the reaction? <laughs> <laughs> it's like this, you know, so it's, you know, maybe it's not the best uh, thing for a junior monk to be bossy and supercilious, you know, and, or for any of us really, is it? Is not to 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 promote ourselves, uh, you know, in that way. But sometimes we do it, and also the position, you know, is threatening. Like just height, I found being big and tall can threaten people that are not. And if you if you've always been, I've always was the tallest boy in the class in school, and so you know I I was always at the end of the line in this primary school I went to. We had to march out according to the drum roll every at the end of the school day, and I was always at the last one. And I was thought it'd be nice to be the first one. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, then found out the how how threatening people are, threatened people are by just height and size, and, and I didn't know that because I, you know, I didn't. I've always, I've never suffered from the feeling of being short. It, it, but the personality is already formed, being used to being tall, and sometimes we don't understand, you know that, you know, what people, how they might see you. Because maybe your intentions are good and kind, of, but they don't see that in you, they see you as a threatening authority figure. But this is something we can actually use, you know, observe. I feel threatened by, I feel, you know, self-conscious or threatened by this monk or this teacher or whatever. You know, and Ratna one people tell me about all these very fierce Ajahns. And so, you know, they, they go to this Ajahn, he's really fierce, and this one, he's really, really fierce. <laughs> and that one, really, really fierce. Yeah. So then I, I say, well, you know, you're already, the Ajahns that are fierce aren't here, unless you see me as that. <laughs> and then, and then uh, but also, they're not here, but right now you think of them and you think fierce. And that you can know that that's, that's about, you know, some sanya in that it's memory or perception that you create in the present. And then we don't see that when we go and meet that Ajahn is supposed to be so fierce. We don't know what we're doing. We, we've already primed ourselves to experience, you know, we feel he's really fierce. When's he going to jump on me? <laughs> and tell me I'm a terrible monk or something. And so you, you already set the stage, a Mizasen experience where you primed yourself to experience something without realizing what you're doing. And that's why it's so important to, to, uh, to be able to get behind that. It's not like some, some people are fierce and they, you know, they they always have this kind of effect on people. But that's also part of the practice, to observe. 
not to create it and carry it, but to observe when that happens, when somebody is very direct or frightening or fierce or threatening to us is like this. And you learn, you know, that that is a condition arising and ceasing. Puto tamo, the Buddha knowing the Dhamma, the way things are. This is how you get to really get behind your own conditioning. There's no other way to do it because it, we, we always operate, you know, we're so conditioned from the time we're born, aren't we? We, we you know, we acquire the, the attitudes of our mother and father and peers and neighbors and societies and nationalities. We acquire all that. There's something we get, you know, through just being there, you know, a kind of innocent babe. You're just absorbing you know, what's around. You know, you don't have the dis- discriminatory ability to see this is true or this isn't. You're just taking everything in, you know, regardless of right or wrong, true or false. And then we all have our own, you know, national identity or gender identities. Gender identity is very strong now. Even though they're always saying gender is no problem, we're all the same. That's like, you know, that's like trying to, to cover up everything with, with, you know, trying to say male and female are exactly the same. <laughs> when they're obviously not. If you had the same gender, there wouldn't be a male or female. <laughs> And then on, on the personal level, we're all the same. But, you know, on a personal, we're all different. I mean, personalities are all different. You know, none of us are the same on that, in that way. And generation, you know, my generation, sometimes, you know, you, you don't, it's hard to understand younger monks because, <laughs> because they, they have different generational experiences. I was brought up in the 30s and 40s in America where, you know, you didn't have television or anything, you had radios. Mm-hmm. And so you, you know, that, and, and, you're, and, um, and America wasn't a superpower then. And it, it was a very different kind of place that I remember and the attitudes were more kind of conservative and and uh, was brought up as a Christian. So, these, these all have an effect on how I interpret experience and myself in the world. And then you consider, you know, your own background, you know, the, the religious background, or maybe you didn't have any religion, or your social identity, or ethnic, or racial identity. These are all conditioned into us. Now, to get Outside that is is to be mindful because consciousness then isn't isn't doesn't have any race or gender. Not like female consciousness and male consciousness. Consciousness is consciousness. And so it's it is not European or Asian or anything, it's just not high class, low class. It's absolutely the same. That's where we're all equal, is we're all conscious. And then what we create into consciousness is not going to be the same, is it? The way I feel right now isn't going to be exactly the way you feel. And so this this knowing, this kind of knowing, is uto, kind of knowledge. And the the quote I use when I chanted the Aparuta de Sangamata Sattaura, that's I always like that because it, it's an announcement, the gate through the deathless is open. It's like, this is when the Buddha was enlightened. The gate, the door, the entrance to deathless, to reality itself. Reality is deathless. Conditioned phenomena is all about death. You know, we're being born and dying, rising and ceasing. Mindfulness puts us into that deathless reality, into the deathless reality. That's the gate, is mindfulness. 
and then sati, sampachanya, is like a, a wide apprehension of reality in the present. It's not about judging or, or criticizing, it's just noticing the way it is both in, in its wide aspect and in its particulars, you know, so you, we're so used to being mindful of particular things like, you know, being mindful when you pick up your glass or put it on your robe, but mindfulness also expands into the moment, which embraces everything in the present, you know, uh, that is, that you can experience in consciousness. So you're not just you know, trying to figure out how to be mindful around the, the particular conditions, but recognize mindfulness, the gate to the, the, the deathless. Just being mindful, picking up your glass, is not the gate to the deathless. It may be that you don't break your glass, <laughs> but it also can be a form of conceit, you know, like that might mean when he picks up his glass. Not mind at all. Not like me. <laughs> or mindfulness is, is, it allows, you know, sloppiness or strictness or whatever. It's, it's not about preference or judging, but awakening. And it is amazing. To me, it's a miracle that we have this ability to do this. When you begin to observe what we have to live with throughout our lives, you know, the physical body itself, and having to live with that, you know, this body is pretty near 78 years old. <laughs> and so it's, you know, and, and it, having to live with it now is not all that pleasant. It's not like when I was younger. But uh, it is the way it is. And then, uh, you know, the sight isn't so good, and uh, all kinds of skin is, you know, have all kinds of skin cancers and problems around, things like this. So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, these, these are not, you know, these are, can be seen in a personal way, which is I don't want them. I don't want stiff knees or skin cancer or, you know, swollen feet or pain or anything. I want to always be vigorous, healthy and good looking. <laughs> but that's not the way it goes. That's, that's a personal thing. But the, the reality is like this. And then, then you, you know, as, uh, in, the, in the, this phase of my life you have to see people you know die, you know, people your own age, or, and you see your mother, my mother and father died 20 years ago, and then Lumpo Chan, and Buddha Tat, and on and on like this, so you're, you're aware of, of loss, increasing loss, and as your, your, your own generation starts dying out, people you, you know, the same age, suddenly you, you hear about their death. But this can be, you know, rather depressing from a personal level, or it's just observing the feeling of grief and loss and disappointment. And looking back on my life as a monk, I just feel incredible gratitude because it, in this lifetime, from my kind of background, just having this opportunity uh, to live like this is, you know, surprises me that I've been so fortunate in finding such a profound teaching and then having, coming to Thailand, such a wise teacher as Lung Pan Cha. And, you know, like Thailand is willing to support us in every way with the requisites, more eager to do it than necessary. So, I mean, you've, you've got everything going for you. And, and so then the kind of mental states, emotional, physical realities that you're experiencing are the way they are. There's some cars you wear the, the presence, 
And if you're patient with sankaras, then they cease and you can be aware of the cessation of a sankara. And that's very important. Otherwise, your mindfulness doesn't connect. It's always aware of the reality of the present as something in its arising state, but you're not aware of its absence. And to really get that flow of mindfulness connected is being aware of presence and absence. Because the sankaras, everyone will take you to the absence of that particular sankara, if you allow it to. Whether it's physical, mental, emotional. So I offer this for your reflection.